Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. Today we are going to have a new speaker Dr. Ratna Thangudu. He is a bioinformatics lead in enterprise science and computing at Rock Valley MD USA. His company deals with large scale data management and provides bioinformatics solutions to various institutes and companies. Dr. Ratna is going to talk to us about large scale data sciences. He will explain what exactly the term big data refers to and how it can be managed. He will also talk about the major issue with the big data and how one can overcome it by sharing the data from all the fields whether it is academia or industries. He will also talk about the importance of multi omic data in understanding biology especially in context of precision medicine. So, let us welcome Dr. Ratna to talk to us about large scale data sciences. Uh, my name is Rajesh Tangudu, I uh, am the bioinformatics lead for the company called Enterprise Science and Computing. So, we are located in Rockville, Maryland, uh, USA. So, we are kind of uh, 10 miles away from the National Institutes of Health. So, that is about 20 minutes drive. And uh, to put it in the context, uh, we are about 30 minutes from the White House. That is where we are. All right. So, uh, what are we doing actually as a company? So, we are into uh, large scale data management of and provide bioinformatics solutions for uh, government clients, academics, and also industry. And we work pretty closely with uh, National Cancer Institute. So, you heard a lot about the CPDAC program for the last few days. So, uh, we actually built and manage all of the resources that they were using. So, I will talk a little bit about that. So, uh, how many of you are actually aware of what is big data? I see a few hands just raising. So, I think I mean you are all part of big data, every day you are contributing to big data. So, I will start from there and try to fit that into uh, the perspective of big data in biology and what we are actually doing with the proteomics and how it, how it is all going there. All right. So, <clears throat> say uh, the word basically big data means it is an extent, extremely large data set that may be analyzed computationally to reveal patterns, trends and also associations which are not easily seen by our regular kind of day to day analysis. And uh, as the data, uh, the name it actually implies it is very large that is understandable that is big data. And then it is very dynamic, it keeps growing, it keeps changing and it is very complex to actually uh, use any of your traditional data processing techniques. For example, take your excel file. So, excel can handle at the most 10 million rows that is it. So, if it crosses that what would you do? So, that is called big data. Anything that crosses the path that you cannot actually analyze with the tools that you have on your desktop that is actually big data. So, with large amount of data it offers a lot of statistical power and the complexity actually leads to some kind of false discovery rates, uh, but that is ok, but we are getting a lot of statistical power there. So, to give you an idea of what exactly is big data, this is the social media big data that we all contribute to on a daily basis every minute. This is the number that is coming from 2017 for how many, what kind of interactions that we do uh, on a daily basis that contribute to the big data. So, I won't show you a lot of things, but for example, Google you see in every minute we almost do 3 million searches. So, every search that you do is a data point. It is not necessarily data it is returning, but the search itself is a data point. Similarly, you watch a lot of YouTube videos. So, the amount of time you spend on YouTube that is a data point and the amount of video content that you upload it is a data point. So, every interaction that we do on a day to day basis is a data point that actually contributes to the big data. All right. So, what is big data again? So, it certainly involves large quantities of data, but it has some characteristics everything if I give you some uh, I say something like a big file I say this is data that is not big data right. Just because the file is big it is not big data. So, it has some characteristics some features to it. 
So this actually started off with describing volume that we just discussed and then there is velocity. How fast you can access it, how fast the data can actually move from point A to point B. So for example, the video streaming, so Netflix, YouTube that you see and also <coughs> the variety of the data. So is it all the same kind of data? No, there is a lot of structured data, there is a lot of unstructured data. Structured data refers to basically anything, the kind of interactions that you do, the airline ticketing system. So the banking transactions, all of the e-commerce things you do, they're all kind of structured data. You know, I mean, which person is doing what at what time and what amount he's spending, that's kind of structured. But what is unstructured? So all the emails that you send every day, it's unstructured it's because it's all text. So you cannot actually assign them to categorize them by words. So that's a, just one example. But as people started looking into the big data, they, they thought, I mean, this is not enough. They came up with more descriptions, okay, they added veracity. Is the data actually valid? I mean, does it make any sense at all? It should be some valid data, right? So then the, some more people came and they said, okay, let's add one more. What is that? It's called veracity. We did veracity, I think value. So does it actually add any value? Right, at the end of the day, you have so much data, I'm talking so much data, like I showed so many points. If that's all not generating money for the, the companies, Google or YouTube, it's of no value, right? So it has to have value also. And then they added, I mean, people came up with more things that's like they said, after veracity, they said visualization. So can we actually look at the data and say something about it? And then they have something called, which I'm missing, viscosity. Does it stick? Is it with you? I mean, does it make any sense at the end of the day? So all these things, like, what I'm trying to say is basically big data is not just one big file that you have or a bunch of files that you have. It has to have some meaning to attach to it when you analyze. All right. So now I jump to big data and biology. So we all know, I mean, next generation sequencing, you're all aware of. We have been discussing for the last several days. Maybe you're all doing your own research on, in that area. So biologists, we joined a big data club long time ago. I think I'd say the uh, advent of the uh, human genome about 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And then, uh, so there are many forms of data, right? Even when <coughs> within the uh, biology, there is genomics, proteomics, molecular pathways, and there is one thing called healthcare. So all the doctor visits that you do, it's recorded in electronic health records. So it's pretty popular back in US and Western world. Uh, I'm not very sure, I mean, probably the, uh, the new corporate hospitals, they're actually doing it already. So there is a lot of EMR data. And uh, all the visits that you do, all the tracking, uh, the healthcare <coughs> tracking devices that you use, Fitbit, it records a lot of data. So it all, if you bring all of them together, it tells something about you. You are predisposing to or you, a particular disease, right? So it allows us to develop new tools, new techniques, new, new ways of understanding the data. So just to give you an idea of where we are actually going with the data that we have. All right, so this is 2000. That's around when the first Sanger sequencing came. So then the human genome project came. And then we have TCGA, we heard about that. So that's about 10, uh, we have first 1,000 genome project. That's about 1,000 genomes. And then uh, we have TCGA, that's about uh, 11,000 uh, patients data. So then the exome sequencing came, that's about 68,000. Now there is the Gasinger Institute back in US that does actually uh, 100,000 genomes. And now people are talking about uh, a million genome. And then there is the new uh, initiative started back in US, it's called All of Us. It's basically looking at almost uh, uh, a million and plus cases across the country. So basically when we're adding data day by day, so as, as one more slide has to increase like this, so every two years the data will double. But Illumina, when they are developed, who are actually uh, developing these uh, uh, NGS machines, they basically said, oh, no, it will go like this. But actually, if you see, it's actually going at that rate. That's a projection. So the exabytes of data. All right. I think I convinced you about how much data is there. And coming back to the actual, actual multi-omics data. So it's not, I, uh, the example I showed before in the earlier slide is just the genomic data I'm talking about. But there are so many facets to the multi-omics data. We have transcriptome, proteome, metabolomes, 
and exposome and epigenome and also the social graph with the demography of the patient or the people it's not just the patient so then there is imaging data there is biosensors so you have to bring all of the together to actually make sense uh, to what if you want to achieve the goal of the precision medicine so that's the personalized medicine all right so where is this all data coming from so people are actually generating a lot of data if people are not sharing it it's not big data anymore right so you generate for 10000 patients your group generates the data and you keep it with you you do not share with anyone else so then it's not a thousand genome that's your genome your your labs genome. but it's actually rapidly changing it actually changed i mean all of the databases that we have now uh, just because of public sharing of the data so if you run a blast on ncbi you are running against a reference genome where is it coming from because people shared the data publicly because it's all funded by the uh, governments so whichever i mean all of the european and uh, american country uh, I mean, uh, us subcontinent basically they whatever the data that's funded by the government that has to be in the public domain that's a requirement all right so so but we are all into proteomics right so where does proteomics stand here so there is a lot of proteomic data out there in the public domain i am not sure how many of you actually aware of that I will show some slides there. Probably you are aware, <coughs> you might have seen it, or some of you actually used it. Uh, but I mean, with the advent of the high-resolution mass spectrometry, and collecting and sharing is a, actually a big challenge, right? You run the instruments, and you saw how much time it took to understand the data. So after that, what do you do? So you run your experiment, you analyze it. Probably you will have a publication, and then what do you do? So the, pub the publisher basically now wants you to actually put that somewhere that's accessible by both the publisher and also from all the people, right? So that's all actually contributing to the public data. And likewise, actually, even though the sub publisher says you submit here, actually for the people who are managing the data, there's the repositories, it's a Herculean task. It's extremely difficult to manage it. That's coming from so many different places. All right. So we did a very good progress in terms of the uh, where we stand in the proteomics community. So there is this consortium proteome exchange. Probably lost a lot of you already heard. So this is a consortium of about six groups. There are the six repositories. So the Pride is the central one. It's the largest public data resource. So that's sitting in Europe. And then we have Massive and Peptide Atlas. I think uh, from ISB, David Campbell is here. He's part of that. And then you have Panorama. Most of you are actually accessed it. And then we have from China and also from Japan. So there are different resources out there. So they have all of the data publicly available. That's a very good question. Um, so I have a slide. Next slide, I will talk about that. Um, earlier, like when these resources started, they actually started taking your raw files and your results, right? So the people and they, <coughs> so we don't know the format of it, so we don't know the validity of it. But now, um, let me go to the next slide. So many data sets are coming from so many different places. Right? In 2016, there are about 4,000 data sets available there. Now, I'll show you the growth of the data. So, they started with okay, just take you whatever you have and also the results also. So, just see here, it started in 2012 where we are, and just is 2015. This, this is a dated slide. This is a 2015, it went to that level, and uh, as of a few days back, I checked. 
just a couple of days back there are 10 species and there are about almost 7000 data sets publicly available through the Proteome exchange. It is not just from one resource, but all the 6 or 7 resources I showed you. And I um, will be I will be answering your question in a bit. So, uh, here is another list of uh, public <coughs> databases that are there. So, uh, some already I already listed there and then some these are actually derived databases. These are the post translational modifications how do you capture. So, there are separate specialized databases out there. And like I said it is not so easy to manage all these data resources it needs a lot of money, a lot of manpower and a lot of expertise. For example, here the tranche or tranche is one data resource it does not exist anymore it is not there anymore because it is lack of funding. So, that is one place actually we took some of the data for the CPTAC, CPTAC used to deposit data in tranche before. So, uh, as a part of the CPTAC data, <coughs> data co coordinating center I will discuss later, but we got all of the data and made it available again. Okay. So, this is I think I will I'll try to answer your question here. So, what are the uses of this data out there? One thing you get a publication, so public a publisher requires you to submit the data somewhere, so that he can validate that. So, the primary use is the why you generated the data, so you have the publication that is the primary use of the data. Uh, so, and then it adds evidence for example, in the Unipro you have all these manually curated validated protein sequences, how is it coming? So, it takes evidence from all the publications people are actually uh, uh, publishing right. So, that adds value that is the primary use and then there is reuse meta analysis. So, you can uh, take data from the 10 different data sets which are similar to your work, but you never knew that they exist. Just because you went to one of these resources you could find you just search for for example, uh, uh, colorectal cancer maybe you will find something there right. So, you go to a publication and you go to PubMed you search for something. So, you get literature you do not get data. So, there is a difference. Uh, so, things are slowly changing, but as time goes by the idea is when you search in PubMed it is not just the publication that comes out it also tells where your data is sitting, what pipeline has been used and how the pipeline has been run and can you actually reproduce the results for yourself with a click of a button. So, that is where people are trying to head. So, we there is a long way to go there, but the vision is there. So, to answer your question basically some of these resources they actually reanalyze all of your data. So, massive for example, they will reanalyze all of your data through their own pipeline and if they find something interesting that did not come through your uh, results they will they are nice to send you an email saying that ok we did find it maybe it will be interesting to you. Uh, that is on the UCSD. It is very difficult to go back and reanalyze all of the data right. So, sometimes they try to analyze all of the data sets together. So, that needs a lot of computing power. All right. So, I, I talked about the meta analysis, uh, the re analysis, for example, here reprocessing. So, all these resources, I mean, these are the, in the center, you see all the primary uh, consortium members, podium exchange uh, repositories. Once you deposit there, there are other resources like Peptide Atlas. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and all the other uh, GPM, DB and they, they to actually take the data and reprocess them. So, that gives new insights and it allows for example, this I already discussed and then it, it provides value to the adds value to the phosphoproteome post translational modifications data sets, data repositories and then finally, there is repurposing. So, you start with the purpose of your uh, uh, experiment is something, but you use that to add value in a different way. So, one example is basically the proteogenomics approach right. So, you have all this data you, you take it you take it I mean, uh, I mean you, you deposit the data, but as a user I will see uh, this is very interesting I will try to find if there are any novel splice junctions I can find. So, I will find so, then I will add that value back to the either uh, NCBI or somewhere I deposit that. So, so uh, basically I am trying to say that data sharing actually helps in use of the data and reuse and reprocessing and also repurposing. I did not talk about reprocess. Okay. Here it helps 
when you always use some pipeline, so the pipelines continuously and constantly evolve, new algorithms are coming. So, in the first attempt you might miss it, but the new algorithms actually might find a new information from the same data set. So, that is one thing the massive does. So, we talked about I mean everybody is generating data depositing there I, I showed almost 6000 data sets there. But if you actually take a look back at any of these resources they collect very minimal metadata because it is very onerous metadata is data about data. So, you describe your data what patient is coming from what samples what protocols you use how did you do that what is the experimental design. So, if you do not provide all the context about your data sets it is all useless right. So, it is just sits in there and I go there and I, I try to get all the data and I cannot do anything. I do not even know which patient it is coming from. So, there is not such the problem here is always the data submission making available making them available in the public domain it starts after you end your research goal right. So, you finish your research objective you achieve that and then you go there because somebody else tells you ok the general says you have to deposit somewhere. So, that is like a burden for a lot of people right. So, I am done with this now I have to do all this like if you actually go and submit in any of these resources it is not so easy you have to collect the data metadata in a certain way and uh, reformat it and submit to them. So, then they validate if there is something missing they will come back to you and ask ok this is missing we cannot actually support unless you provide this. So, the amount of metadata that they, they require actually they try to shrink it because it is becoming burden and people will stop submitting. So, we want the data to come. So, let us I mean send give us the minimal metadata and we will just keep it there and see how we can process it. So, that is not really helping and then there is short of shortage of expertise. So, as the data sets is growing so many data sets so much volume. So, we need expert people to handle that. So, now the expert is limited to the resources like pride and peptide atlas and all this uh, and then lack of adoption of standards. I will talk a lot more about the standards in a little later, uh, but standards is how do you represent your data. So, are you using any of the existing controlled vocabularies to define what it is. So, you are saying TMT and somebody says uh, uh, capital letters or small letters. That is a very basic example I am giving, but if you actually go into the clinical data side it is the same disease breast cancer there are so many subtypes. If you just say breast cancer it does not help you have to tell exactly what it is. So, there are standards to help you do that, but when you submit you have to do that actually all right. So, I talked a lot about what is already there I did not talk anything about the CP tag right CP tag produces a lot of data. Uh, so, that is a consortium we are part of it we develop the we manage the data coordinating center and we also uh, uh, distribute all of the data. So, we started pretty low. So, uh, the CPTAC 2 program three cancer types breast colon and uh, ovarian about 600 patients. So, they started off with uh, some TCGA samples which are already there ok there are genomics data is already existing. So, why do not we take them some 100 samples from each of these patients and reanalyze with proteomics and they try to combine. So, uh, it is a phase 1 after that they realize ok these samples are not optimized for proteomics. So, we need to collect more. So, then they collected 300 more for each of those cancer types. So, there is a lot of success and now the current running program is CPTAC 3. So, there are more at least 10 more cancer types they added. So, it is a very ambitious and large program it is not in terms of the volume of the data that they are generating because proteomic data is much smaller compared to the genomic data. Uh, but this, the breadth of the uh, coverage of the, the cancer types and what they are trying to do in terms of the proteogenomics it is it is uh, pretty big all right. So, we manage the CPTAC data coordinating center this is basically the consortium has about uh, 15 to 20 different groups or institutions for example, uh, for the last three days you saw at least three groups here representing them. So, one is Broad Institute you have uh, NYU New York, New York University and also Bing Zhang is from Vanderbilt University. So, there are three different groups that are working. So, they just represented three groups, but they we have another 15 groups sitting there. Uh, 
So all is all these people are actually generating data, so we have to actually coordinate that. So the data actually refers to clinical data, the biospecimen data, genomic data, proteomic data, imaging, and so many aspects to it. So uh, the private portal is specifically for the consortium members. So it's a controlled access; they can only log in and they exchange the data. And then we have a public portal. So can you? How many of you actually went to use this resource? So the idea is. Uh, I, I really encourage you to go to that resource. So, I mean, the purpose of this talk is basically to introduce you to all these resources. There is so much data is already there. Start taking a look, and you don't have to generate anything. There is already some so much is sitting there. Just to try, you don't even have to have a new discovery. Just to try. And then uh, we also have a uh, asset portal. Okay. So we did this in collaboration with the. Uh, 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 Georgetown University. We put a lot of effort on SF portal to make it because for each assay there is a stamp from NCI. So you might have seen there is a check mark there saying that it's kind of branded. Uh, so if there is some information missing, we will definitely take a look. All right. So this is the uh, portal's uh, landing page. Uh, you can go to the proteomics uh, dot cancer dot go and it will tell some information there and you can click a link. So. Uh, it's uh, we, we use the Aspera technology uh, to transfer. Aspera it supports very high volume data transfers at very high speeds. So, but it, it uses the UDP technology. So most of the university's academic institutions they block it. Right. So it's not too hard. Like if you reach your IT department uh, for IIT and ask them to open a particular port. So we can provide sufficient information if you if it is if it is a problem. Like you cannot just go and ask them to open a port. Uh, it's a security hole. Uh, but if, if you want some information from our side, we can actually write to them saying that uh, because all of the US will use that resource. Okay. All right, so we have about uh, 13 terabytes of data right now. So that's about 43 studies. So uh, I talked about only about three cancer types, but there are 40, the data is organized into 43 different studies. And so far, for the last six years, we have so many visits, like people coming and clicking and browsing our uh, resource. And we have only 13 terabytes data, but it's been downloaded. The actual download amount is about 400 terabytes, close to 400 terabytes. That's, a, that's not a lot when you compare, to, compare with the genomics. But what is interesting here is this number. The number of files that are downloaded is almost 2 million, or close to 3 million. What it means is, Along with uh, the raw data, we actually provide the uh, uh, results from the common data analysis pipeline that we run on the portal. So these files are just the gene uh, sample matrices that you are using for all the uh, uh, Morpheus um, hands-on uh, session. All right. So what the Uh, I will just come there. Basically, for for each study, we run a common data analysis pipeline. So that generates the result files. These are the summary reports, the <coughs> routine parsimony results, the identified peptides, identified proteins at a certain uh, uh, threshold. So most people probably want those files. They don't need raw files. So if you download raw files, it's not helping you if, unless you have a uh, uh, established pipeline and resources to actually analyze, reanalyze the data. So what I'm trying to say here is basically just the volume of the downloads you see, it's basically a lot of people are actually interested in the result files. That's what you want. You don't just go there and you see, I, oh, there's a lot of data I, ha I have to download. It's always there. You don't have to worry about it. It's not going anywhere. And you don't have to actually download if you don't want to. You just go through the results and use that information. All right. So this is just uh, trying to show how many people actually access the data from throughout the world. And I see very few dots from here. But I think that will increase when I, when I go back home, I think I will see a lot of dots. I hope you have learned that why sharing correct data is important and how it can help people across the world 
to find solutions to the problems where individuals fail to solve. You got a glimpse of how contributing to big data also helps in obtaining the reproducible data sets which could help in finding the most reliable candidates or even potential biomarkers for various data sets from different studies. I hope you have also learned about proteome exchange and its evolution in terms of data with time. Hence, one should emphasize further on sharing the correct data with society. In the next lecture, we will continue Dr. Ratna's lecture where he will talk to you about large scale data, data sciences and give you few examples. Thank you.